This is a patient of actually uh, Dr. Travelers, he referred to us, and uh, keratoconus, he's had uh, surgery, um, epion in both eyes, uh, intacts in both eyes. He's tried just about every refractive um, thing possible as far as glasses don't work, contact lenses, soft lenses, RGPs, hybrids. Uh, he came in wearing hybrids. He's about 20, 30 minus uh, with the hybrid lenses. And uh, he's unhappy with pretty much every lens. Uh, they just get uncomfortable and dry up on him. You can see his uh, prescription is, um, in his glasses is not so good. It's about eight and a half to half hours of astigmatism in the left eye. So what can we do next? I'll give you a hint. It rhymes with miracle. At least my patients say it rhymes with miracle. Sclerals. Scleral rhymes with miracle. So. <laughs> and uh, we're back to the question, does uh, size matter? Sometimes it does. Uh, we have uh, a mini scleral and scleral lenses. Would, uh, with scleral lenses, they, def they never touch the cornea. Is there a laser pointer here? No. Right on the photo. Right on the photo. OK, so we Wow, this thing is like a lightsaber. <laughs> <laughs> so we have here, we have here the the uh, bulb, the cornea is there. The cornea, the the scleral lens never touches the cornea, and um, we sometimes do, we like to use mini sclerals a lot because uh, it's easier for the patient to handle it. So it, t it lands on the sclera here, where with the full size sclerals it's a little bit larger diameter, uh, but it gives you a little bit wider uh, landing zone. On to the next slide. I think it makes it a little easier too because somebody who's never had contacts in their eyes before anything like that to put especially a smaller diameter lens at first which is similar in size to a soft lens it's not as scary than throwing on a 16.5 or a 17 size so that definitely helps too. True. So the way we see patients that travel sometimes a couple hours to see us so to speed up the process is we, we have them put the lenses in that we think is best and um, the lenses actually this is these arrows for some reason aren't lined up properly the red arrow is actually, that red arrow is a tear lake. Uh, the scleral lens is over here, and we actually have a measurement there, it's about 200 microns, and then that's the cornea. Uh, this guy has intacts and a little bit of a apical scarring. Uh, what we do is, can anybody tell me what you think that um, blue arrow is, or where I'm putting the pointer? Because we have the patient go home, or, or not go home, but go out for a few hours, and we put a lens on top of the scleral lens in order to speed up the process. Uh, because with our stock lenses, a lot of times we put a lens on and then we do an over-refraction, we get like a minus nine over-refraction, and we're not sure what you know the final power is going to be, so instead we'll put a soft contact lens on top, let them go for a few hours, and then have them come back, we check to see how much it's uh, settled, you know, usually it's settled between 50 and 100 microns, and then, um, you know, it saves the patient a step from uh, with the fitting process. Uh, and so that patient ended up being uh, around 20, 20 minus, so went from 2030 to 2020 minus with those lenses. Uh, the second patient, this guy came in with a, uh, it was with a sighted guy, he was legally blind, uh, 22 years old, can't co tolerate any type of uh, glasses, contact lenses, he's got severe allergies, and um, he's got pretty, pretty high uh, advanced keratoconus, uh, K readings over 70 to 70 diopters. Can anybody name some findings here in this patient? We, we got four findings. Munson sign, yes. We also, oh, you can't really appreciate it, but there's also apical scarring. And over here, we have some injection. Now, there's one more feature. We got unibrow. <laughs> Not sure if that's associated with keratoconus, though. Uh, this guy, he has an apical scar. Uh, it's just showing, you know, how 160 microns of clearance. He's a happy patient. It's pretty much changed, uh, changed his life. Uh, his vision with the refraction was 2350 in that left eye. Uh, what do you think his refraction is now? It's kind of hard to see the apical scar, but it's a pretty good sized apical scar there. And he's wearing a scleral lens right there. Um, anyone have any guesses on what, what his corrective vision is with the scleral lens? 2030. I'd like to say 2020. It's not 2020 for uh, this particular patient, but he's actually 2040. And uh, he's, able to, yeah, he's able to drive. He's able to, uh, he's able to, he's back in school. Very happy patient. Another patient of ours, uh, 2200 with his RGPs, now he's 2020, big apical scar. It's amazing what they can do for the vision. I'll let Dr. Abraham do it. All right, so another case. This is a 24-year-old Hispanic male. He's been told in the past, I think about a year or two before we saw him, that he has a lazy eye. So, and told that nothing can be done. They basically prescribed him glasses. Uh, without anything, I mean, you know, he was kind of squinting out the big E, maybe a little bit 
better than that. Um, I had him try on his glasses, which were about a year old, and still that right eye, I wasn't getting too much of an improvement. Left eye get, definitely got a lot better. Um, checked out his refraction, definitely a big anisa going on there, but is anybody thinking refractive amblyopia here? That's what he was at least told before. I, I was a little suspicious. I always do retinoscopy in all my patients if I can, and that definitely gave me the key right there when I started to see the scissoring, and it was really hard to refract him. So of course, uh, this finally gave the answer with his case. So now we're finally diagnosing him for the first time with keratoconus. And of course, he had the normal findings. I wish I had a better picture to put up there. I think I have one afterwards. Um, definitely see the cone. He's had little both stria, of a superiorly Munson sign, all the, the classic signs. But he had a little bit of dry eyes too. So this is the first time he's heard about it. You know, and no one's ever told him he's had keratoconus. Um, what are you guys thinking would be the best thing to do next? Or what would you guys do? First time care to come at us. I think I heard him say it over there. Cross, cross. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and we've, we've talked to this patient about it too, so hopefully he's going to make his way over and do the, the cross linking. But we decided to take it a little bit further and start him on scleral lenses. And so this is kind of his eye. It's a little bit hard to appreciate. He doesn't have any scars, but you can kind of see the scleral lens. We started him with a, a 15 uh, diopter, 15 um, millimeter size lens. We did eventually, eventually end up going to a 16.5 to just give him a little bit more vault and clearance. But um, definitely great comfort. He hasn't tried anything else. We didn't want to go to the RGPs and the hybrids. We just thought let's just go straight to sclerals. And you can kind of see the vision. Um, Atlantis is just what we went with um, by Excel. They happen to have a new lens that's out that's supposed to be superiorly better as far as visual acuity, their optics is better, and we can kind of change the edges a little easier so if the patient has a great central area but their edges are doing something different that we don't like, we just have more areas to manipulate. And as you can see here, the vision was amazing. He definitely hasn't seen 2020 in a long time, if ever, that we know of, and vision's great. And he was actually pretty depressed about his vision, especially when someone told him, oh, there's nothing we can do about it, that's it, you're just not gonna see out of that right eye. Um, now he's able to see everything. He was a little bit depressed, and when we first put on those lenses and he saw 2020 for the first time, he actually got tears in his eyes a little bit because it was just such a big change for him. He actually got us a little bit teary eyed as well because his wife was expecting that the week. first child, yes. And he really hasn't been able to see people's faces clearly, and he's like, I'm going to be able to see my daughter's face when she's for born. the first time, yeah, and be able to just see everything, you know, even his wife probably a little bit better too. But uh, we do sclerals on everybody, so definitely keratoconus, keratoglobus, ectasias from you know PRK or LASIK, um, definitely corneal transplants too, and of course you know he showed some pictures of after intacts, and um, we have one of the studies we were looking at here, you know scleral lenses should be considered a lens of choice in eyes with complex corneal geometry, as besides re rehabilitation, their use may delay and prevent further surgical involvement. So definitely all your corneal transplant patients and even other surgical you know, people, it's always great to, to put them in sclerals too. Plus it gives them better vision as well. And we're thinking it would probably help if they're already fit in scleral lenses then you do cross-linking, you might be able to put a scleral lens on top of their eye after cross-linking, maybe use it as a bandage contact lens. We haven't tried that yet, but I think we were talking with uh, Dr. Traveler about maybe considering mm -hmm. doing that. Yeah, we even do it on nor normal corneas too. So people who are severe dry eyes and they just, they've tried everything, they've tried restasis, they're on the omega threes, they've you know, done everything out there and they're still very dry. Then we like doing sputters for those patients too because you're you know, able to get your own tears and a whole bunch of just hydration all day in that one lens and people are very happy with their dry eyes afterwards too. And now there's also a multifocal um, option uh, fitting the patient who has like a minus nine with two and a half diopters of astigmatism and uh, she's 20-20 in the distance, uh, J1 for reading. And uh, just, she doesn't have keratoconus but just real high astigmatism. Yeah. And scleral lenses have been around for so long but it's just amazing. Every year we're definitely now trying out some more different types of sclerals they've just come out with. So. It's even if we've had some patients in the past, oh, I've tried sclerals, it didn't work. Well, how long ago? Well, it was like maybe seven, eight years ago. Well, let's try it again because things have definitely changed. So we can get better vision and comfort a lot more easier, I think, now than maybe 10 years ago. Um, if you ever want to know who's fitting sclerals in your area, I know they have um, a website, scleralens.org, and I know you, know you can kind of look up anybody in your area that's around there who's fitting these sclerals as well. And then, of course, you can always email us. Yeah, anytime if you have a question. Yeah, because we have a whole network of scleral fitters as well. Yeah. Any questions? Uh,
just going to say, just to add to it, yes. um, scleral lens fitting is a skill set within optometry. It is a, is a distinct skill set within optometry. Definitely. And just because somebody's fitting scleral lenses doesn't mean they're good at fitting scleral lenses. Mm -hmm. And I, I would very much take their uh, uh, suggestion to talk to people within the community about it in your area. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, I just want to know what type of solution you're putting, just basic what kind of solution you're using for your patients to. Yeah. Uh, we, we prefer to use inhalation saline. It comes in pink vials, and uh, you can RX it even. Uh, it's the same stuff that uh, goes in a nebulizer. It's considered off-label, but uh, it's uh, better than using Unisol. Some people have uh, problems with the stabilizers in the Unisol, so we prefer using inhalation saline. We also put, uh, and actually that's a good plug for Oasis, they're sponsoring, and we put, have patients put uh, two or three drops of Oasis Tears, Oasis Tears Plus, in the scleral bowl before they put it in, and uh, that usually helps with comfort and uh, helps prevent midday uh, hazing, because some people with really very, with very dry eyes, they get a haze from um, all the protein in the tears, and it usually takes a couple months for that eyes to normalize before that goes away, and Oasis Tears seems to help with that. Yeah, we have patients wearing them for 15, 16, 17 hours, so anything we can do to make sure they don't have to take it out, refill it again, and put it back in helps a lot. Marguerite and Jody. Go ahead, Jody. Go ahead. Sure. Just a quick question for you, or really for anyone in the room, and whether, I'm not even sure if this makes sense, but for patients who are full-time scleral lens wearers, there's no more contact of uh, really anything with that corneal surface. So is there a rationale or any data that's been published on now that we've relieved the sheer store of stress of the lids on the cornea, and now there's a barrier if they rub, they're not pressing on the cornea. Is there any data to show this helps to slow progression of keratoconus? Anything published out there? Any rationale for that even? And anecdotally, yes, but I've really looked in the literature heavily for that because I'm writing a case report right now that will be published, and I can't find anything in the literature saying that uh, you know, without with the, the scleral lens actually slows down the progression. I think it does. And, yeah. we, both and we know there's a high, you know, we were talking about allergies and keratoconus and rubbing the eyes. I definitely think it, it acts as a barrier and a protection for that. So I just haven't seen the research yet either. That was great, Julian Nate. Um, because of the nature of your practice, do you ever see people who've worn soft lenses for like 30, 40 years who now have stem cell failure? No, no, sorry. But you can use scleral lenses for host or scrap disease, so if they're having stem cell failure. Uh, we also use, uh, Dr. Donaldson was talking about it, uh, autologous serum. You can actually fill the scleral bowl with autologous serum, and it's extremely healing. It's better than you know, putting a drop in six times a day, because whatever you put in that scleral bowl is going to be there the whole day. The reason I ask is that uh, you hear on the bongos that there are people out there who've had soft lenses on, taking them out at night, not abusing them, right. who go into stem cell failure after 30, 40 years. I've never seen one. I yeah. was wondering. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our last question? We're finding that uh, patients after cross-linking are oftentimes easier to fit with contact lenses. Are you finding that as well, especially with these scleral lenses? Yeah, I think so. Well, sclerals can be difficult either way, so. Well, I think the visual acuity is definitely better too. I mean, you know, a lot of times we're at least able to get this patient to 2020, and we're getting a lot of patients there. But sometimes when you have just that that larger cone, it's hard to get them to that good of vision. So after crosslinking, when we're hoping that their vision gets a little better, and sometimes they don't, yeah, I think it's a little bit easier to fit as far as getting that vision sharper. The fit itself, because we're vaulting over the cornea, I don't think makes a difference because we're we're it's, it's almost like we're ignoring the cornea and just making sure you get the. Cornea.